Hey guys, John here. So this video is gonna be a little bit more relaxed from the other ones. I wanted to share a little bit of advice, at least in my opinion, for learning sound design, at least in 2024. I've seen this question come up a lot, especially on different subreddits and different forums and people are getting into sound design and they're like, how do I even start? How do I, how do I get into this, right? They, they go through the timeline of like, okay, I'm learning about mixing and they get samples and then they use presets. And at some point they decide, okay, this is cool. I like doing this, but I kind of want to expand my horizons a little bit more. I want to learn sound design. I want to, I want to be able to make this sound that I hear on this song that I like. I want to be able to make my own bass. I want my songs to be more creative. I want to, I want to be more part of it, more involved. And that's really cool. That's kind of what drew me in as well. I was like looking at all these plugins. I'm like, man, people make some really cool sounds. How do they do that? I remember years ago looking at Citrus and, and some of the sequences in there, I'm like, what on earth is going on here? I didn't even know where to begin to start decoding these things, right? So in this in this spot, in the very beginning, you kind of, you don't really know what you don't know. And you just look at these plugins, you're like, what the hell is going on? How, how did someone get this sound in this software? Like, what the hell, right? And this was a long time ago. This is like 2004, right? And there's some still pretty cool sequences in there. So I guess some advice I would say, at least from for my journey, I didn't try to say, I'm going to learn everything about everything. Like that, that was a hope that was really cool, but you just got to take it one step at a time. And definitely now there's so much information out there. A, a good one that I think a lot of people recommend is Centorial. I did the demo of that and I made it all the way through the levels and it was really cool because at the beginning, you really, it's it's really hard to discern little, little minute things, right? There's a lot of ear training that, that happens, right? We might not know the difference of a saw wave and a square wave. We know what they look like. We know that they look like different symbols, but we don't sometimes know what they sound like because they can sound a little similar in the very beginning. And you're like, I don't know if that's a saw wave or that's a square wave. So it's kind of hard to, to listen properly, right? Because after a long time and making patches and making different effects and stuff like that, you can kind of know what different recipes are. Right. If someone has like a lead, you, you at some point you're gonna be like, okay, so that's that's basically made from square waves, or those are gonna be made from, made from like pulse width modulation square waves, or that's just a saw and then a square at the bottom, and they're using a little bit of course. Like after a while, you're gonna start getting into that. So I would say maybe pick a synthesizer that you like, maybe one or two, or really depends on what you want, because this this thought process is I'm kind of maybe the outlier of this one, because most people say pick one synthesizer and stick with that guy and use that one and don't kind of look at anything else. And I can see where, where they're coming from. That is good advice. I couldn't follow that personally. Like, like I was saying in some of the podcasts, I was like, well, I like that concept because you do start to learn that synthesizer, but after a while, it kind of doesn't have that that excitingness to it, right? You know, when you get a new plugin or you get a new synth and it's like, oh, okay, this is fun. You get to discover all the cool things, right? You get into a video game and you discover the different levels, the different things you can do or build or make in them. And it becomes fun. And then after you play it for so long, you're like, okay, it's not really as fun as it was before. And then you go on to a different game. Maybe that's really fun. So that was kind of my process, but I kind of did it in a rotation. I kind of took those, that advice and kind of just molded that into a com completely different way. I would, I would start with, for example, Citrus in, in FL Studio. I would spend an entire month with that one, and I wouldn't really touch any other ones. I would just focus on that one and make three patches a day and save all those. And at, by the end of the month, I would compare the patches that I made in the first couple days, maybe the first week, and then the patches that I made in maybe the last week or the last few days. And I would notice a significant improvement. But at that point, Citrus was getting boring for me. I was like, I, I really don't want to look at this interface ever again. So I kind of just followed that feeling and I'm like, okay, let me just open up Harmer and play with that one for a month. And this one seemed exciting. There's so many things to, to discover in that one. And I did the same thing, right? So an entire month, three patches a day, did the same comparison the first week and then the last week. I'm like, this is cool. I like this. This is a lot of fun. By the end of that month, I did notice the per, the per, <laughs> the progress that I made. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm getting somewhere. This is really cool. But then at the same time, like, oh, I don't want to look at Harmer again. So then... I'll kind of rotate out different synthesizers. And then when pigments came out, I'm like, holy crap, this is my main one, which which that one I have never really felt bored in. That's kind of one of the only ones that I'm like, this one is really cool. I love the interface. I never really felt that staleness. Sometimes maybe, but overall it was, I was just always had a good time in that one. So then after like months of, of using pigments, it would always be in my workflow. And then I'd find other stuff and kind of get that excitingness. 
And then after doing that quite a few times, then I would eventually circle back because I'd run out of synthesizers at that time and I'd end up back on Citrus. I'm like, oh, hell yeah, I'm back on Citrus. And it was exciting because all the information I picked up from that month, I still had in my head. I had to maybe refine it a little bit with the interface. But after like a day or two, I felt like I upgraded my Citrus specific skills in sound design. So you kind of do that for a little while. And that's one of the main thing, time. You have to, you have to be patient with yourself. Like you cannot make really complex or really cool sounding patches that you're happy with for a little bit of time. And everyone's speed is different, right? Some people might get this down in like a couple months. Some takes years. Some people never figure it out. Some people, they're like, I'm not really that great at it. But other people are like, this guy is amazing, right? It all depends on your perspective, but you do need time. You do need to practice with it. And I would suggest to do it at least every day, maybe an hour, maybe half an hour, but every single day, at least try to make one or two or three patches at the very minimum and just keep going, keep going, keep trying to make new stuff. And then at that point, once you're kind of like understanding, okay, I know what oscillators do. I know what filters do. I know what envelopes do. I'm, I kind of understand what these different effects do. Once you're kind of at that point, then you can start venturing out in different videos. And I say this with a grain of salt because you can get lost in a lot of videos, even mine included. Like there's a lot of times where you should stop the videos and then go into your DAW and just kind of play around with things. And only when you're really stuck on something or you don't know how a certain routing works or something like that, maybe refer to the manual or look at a tutorial course. And once you figure out your answer, like, okay, I got my answer from, from the video that I'm watching, pause that video. You can maybe come back to it if you want to, but go back to your synthesizer and kind of just keep going because we can get lost in this whole video. Like, how do I make this patch? How do I make this patch? And we kind of get the idea in our head and that's great. But sometimes we don't actually apply it because we have to get the information and then we have to apply it, right? So like, for example, I wanted to make a, the most realistic stand-up bass sound that I could. And I gathered as much information as I could out there, read some books about it and kind of figured out what makes a stand-up bass a stand-up bass. And then I made a lot of different patches to try to mold that sound. And eventually I got to a result that I was happy with. And I'm like, great, this is pretty cool. So that just goes to show that had I not actually applied the information that I read, that I picked up on videos and articles and stuff like that, and actually applied that information, I probably would have never made that patch. I would have thought in my head, oh yeah, I can make a stand-up base, no problem. And then once I go and apply the information that I had, it wouldn't have come out how I eventually made it after trying a few times and finding my own way to, to make it so I was happy with that. So yeah, so there's a lot of ingredients of time and then just keep going, keep keep making patches, keep making sounds. And then once you kind of upgrade to that level and you're starting to understand things and you're starting to look at stuff and like, okay, what is it, What is reverb? What is actually reverb? What is delay? What is chorus doing? What are all these different effects doing? Because once we listen to some patches, we listen to the whole thing. We listen to what the oscillators are doing. We listen to what the filter is doing, what the envelopes are doing and the modulation happening and then the effects on top of that and perhaps some post-processing. So we, we look at this and we see almost a polished finished product and then we load up our synthesizer and we press a, a note and it's just like a saw wave. And we're like, what the hell is this? How do I, how do I go from the saw wave to that? So that's one of the steps where you kind of need to understand what effects do. And maybe you can go on a little bit of a binge. You kind of read what they do, listen to what they sound like, and spend some time in your synthesizer. Just got a saw wave and then start using one effect. Maybe put the chorus on there and play with all those settings and kind of get a sonic imprint of what, of what that sounds like in your head and in your, your headphones, your speakers, whatever it is you monitor on. And that's also an important point as well. Like you, you really do want to have a monitor system that actually reproduces all the sound that you're trying to make, because if you're trying to make a patch or trying to make a sound and you can't hear certain frequency ranges, then you're kind of already starting off at a disadvantage. Maybe get a better pair of speakers or a better pair of headphones that can actually reproduce that in a better way. So that's kind of the initial stuff right there. And once you have that kind of in the bag and you're feeling kind of good and you, you, you feel comfortable in whatever synthesizers that you're, that you're picking from, from that point, I would suggest maybe the synthesizer that you like the most at that time or your favorite one that you feel comfortable in, load up two instances next to each other and find a couple patches that you like. And on one of them, the, the patch that you load on that you like, you're like, okay, this is a cool sound. I want to recreate this. You literally have the recipe right in front of you. All you have to do is decode it. So load that one up, load up a fresh instance right next to it, turn the effects off, and then maybe if you can, maybe disable some of the modulation at first, and then focus first on the oscillators. What, what are the shapes this oscillator is doing? Is this a saw wave? Is this a square wave? Is this a triangle wave? Is this maybe something in between? Is, it, is there maybe FM happening on a sine wave or maybe on a triangle wave or something weird like that? 
And then once you figure out what's going on in the oscillators, then rebuild that in your init patch. And then, okay, you got that. So where are these oscillators going? They're going to the filter. Got it. What kind of filter? Is this a low pass 24? Is this a 12? Is this a six? Is this something crazy like a 36 or a super, super steep one or something like that? And then you got that. Okay. Now, is there any drive on the filter? Is there, how much resonance is on the filter? Okay. You apply that. And then you think, okay, so now we have the oscillators going to the filter. Is there any filter modulation happening, right? There's generally an envelope that's modulating that filter cutoff. What is that doing? And then, you know, try to match that as best as you can. And then, okay, so what's the loudness contour doing? What's the amp, what's the amp envelope doing? How is that one set up? And then once you kind of got that basic sound going, now is the time to maybe unsuspend the rest of the modulation because maybe maybe there's some modulation that's going like if you're in diva for example maybe there's some modulation that's moving the shape right of the of the waveforms and maybe that has a huge impact on on the sound got it okay so start looking at where these modulation targets are going how how much is the depth how much is this modulation happening and then once you do that then then look at the effects say okay so now we have all this effects deck now how are these effects working and depending on the synthesizer that you're in maybe you're in avenger right maybe you have one oscillator going to this first stack of effects, okay? Turn everything off and then just look at that first stack. Maybe oscillator two, three, and four are going to effects two. Got it. Okay, so look at where the, where the signal is going and then turn off these effects from the bottom to the top and start enabling the first one and see what are those settings? How is that actually changing the sound? And then once you got that, kind of keep going, process and process and process. And by the end of that, you're gonna figure out, okay, this is how this is constructed. Now, the first couple of times doing that, there's going to be a lot of copying and pasting. Okay, this is that. And then you put it over here. Oh, that's what that's doing. And that's normal. That's fine. It's probably what you should do, kind of get into that workflow. But after that, you should first load up the patch that you like, listen to it for a little bit. Don't look at the settings yet, but try to get an, an approximation as close as you can based on the knowledge that you heard. And then kind of see where you're going. And once it sounds a little bit too wrong, then maybe try it a little bit more. And if you still can't get it, then kind of look at the settings and say, oh, okay, this is what I was doing. It wasn't this type of filter, it was that type of filter. It wasn't this effect, it was that effect. It wasn't a phaser, it was actually a flanger. And <laughs> you know, we, we all get tripped up by that sometimes. So that's kind of the process. So we're in 2024, you don't need to spend a lot of money to do this. You can get a paid synth, which if you know if that's what you want to do, great. But there are a lot of free options out there, right? A lot of people suggest Vital to start with because yes, it's free. You don't have a really monetary investment to really get into like the crazy synthesizers out there. It can do a lot. Then you also have Surge, which sounds fantastic, by the way. The, the filters on Surge are just amazing. And not to mention, there's lots of other free synthesizers out there as well, not to mention free effects, free EQs, plugins, compressors, distortions. I mean, you name it, there's a lot of free software out there. So it's not like you have to really invest a lot of money into your software. You can later on. But the stuff that you probably should invest your money into is either headphones or speakers, because again, if you can't hear what you're actually mixing or what you're making or the sound that you're trying to carve out or compare something to, how do you expect to get somewhere if you can't see where you're going? So that's why it's probably best spent your, your at least your money into something of quality that you can listen to, because at the end of the day, that's what you're <laughs> what you're monitoring on. Those are your that's your roadmap, right? If you're driving a car down a road and there's a fog and you can barely see, how do you expect to go where you're trying to go if you can't see, if you don't know where you're going? That's kind of that whole point there. But to kind of wrap this whole thing up here, the main thing is time. Don't give up. Do this daily, every single day. And then the comparing patches is great. Building three patches a day is great. And just keep hitting it and keep hitting it. And after a while, you're going to start going on different timelines of different things, right? You're going to notice that Different sound designers do things a little bit differently. If you have any of the Yuhi stuff, study some of the patches in there because those are really, really, really intense, especially in Zebra. If you look at how those are set up, you're like, oh my God, how how is this modulation set up? And, and then you, you figure out, oh, that's a clever way to do that. And then you kind of get these little tr tricks from, from all these sound designers, all the preset packs that we've accumulated over the years. Those are a valuable thing of information that we can really make advantage of. So if we have a pack that by someone that we like, we can look at these and just meticulously study every single knob, every modulation depth, every modulation source, destination. What are the effects doing? How is it sounding so good in our ears just by some synth patch? So that's something that I would definitely recommend to do. And I will uh, <clears throat> I will say that it will be frustrating. It will be annoying. There's gonna be a lot of times where you throw it on your headphones and you're like, this sucks, I, I'm not meant for this. Those, those are going to be little roadblocks for you, and you have to pass that. If you're feeling frustrated and you're like, this, I can't do this, just put it down, clo close down your system, 
take a break, walk outside, and then come back to it when you're feeling a little bit more inspired. Maybe listen to some tracks that you like, or maybe watch some videos about some synthesizers that you like or something like that and get, get that feeling again. And once you do, then kind of go, you know, hit it again, because you really shouldn't feel so frustrated and, and upset once you're trying to make a patch. That's, you're only going to get diminishing returns at that point. So, yeah, with that being said, um, hopefully that's some, some advice for that, because I see that question pop up quite a few often. How do I even get started? How, how do I do this? What do these buttons do? What do these sliders do? I don't even get how this stuff works. And everybody starts on the, off that way. You know, anybody who sees a synthesizer they're, for the first time and they look at it, they're like, what is every, you know what every button does? The same thing like a mixing console, right? If someone looks at it, what, you know what all those buttons do? And it's like, well, yeah, I mean, a lot of the times they do a lot of the same things. They're just, you know, a lot of different inserts and channels and stuff like that. So... Synthesizer can be a lot like that, right? A lot of the interfaces are going to be different, but at the end of the day, you're going to have oscillators, you're going to have filters, you're going to have envelopes, you're going to have effects for the most part, right? You're going to have some modulation sources, and they're going to be in different ways. Different companies will apply that a little bit differently. They'll have different approaches. And then once you start getting to a comfortable spot, this is the last one I promise, once you start getting to a comfortable spot in, in your, your sound design skills, then it's kind of a cool way to branch out and see what other things are because filters do sound different. Oscillators do sound different. Envelopes react differently. The whole synthesizer will be different. It'll be the same components, right? Like there's all sorts of different cars out there and they all drive, right? They all go, they stop, they accelerate, they slow down, they turn. So do synthesizers, but all those different cars will be different. Like, you know, when you get into a different car and you press the brakes and sometimes it's super sensitive and you're like, oh my God, like your brakes are so sensitive. Or there's other cars where you like have to really push in your foot for the car to stop. So it's kind of like that or the accelerator, like in your car, you know, you're like, oh, hit an accelerator. It's kind of, you're used to it. But then you get into another car and you press the gas and you just fly. You're like, oh my God. Right. So it's kind of that concept where they all basically do the same thing, but they have a different approach of getting there. And the, the parts also kind of work a little bit differently, which in the end will get you a different sound. Also, the interfaces, how you use those synthesizers, which is a big part of it, will also create a different sound. Because you can make a lot of the same sounds and a lot of the same different kind of synthesizers. But if the UI is a little bit different and a little bit maybe... I guess, unorthodox to you, then you'll probably approach it in a whole different way, which at the end, you'll end up with a whole different sound, which is kind of cool. Maybe you'll end up with a sound that you never even thought you would make because that UI is different, which is a really cool concept to think about, which is one of the reasons I do like pigments because that interface is very clean. It's very simplistic. And it's one I personally recommend to beginners and people who are actually very good at sound design because it kind of feeds both worlds. You can do a lot in it. And once you reach a point of a limitation where you're like, I need more than... I don't know, X amount of oscillators, I need more about X amount of filters, then maybe at that point, maybe you can branch out to something a little bit more advanced, something maybe like Falcon or Phase Plan or something that you may you might want to expand those horizons or make some more in-depth sound design. Or maybe you're like, I want to dive into modular because that's just a full playground and you can do whatever you want to do. So yeah, that's just a tip of advice for starting sound design in 2024, really, I guess any year at this point. But uh, yeah, just don't give up. Keep making your patches. And I promise you, you will get better. It's just like anything. Just practice and practice and practice and you're going to get better. So yeah, thank you for watching. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next video.